Welcome back. In the last session, we looked at the story of the sinful woman at the house of Simon the Pharisee. Then we spoke briefly about the agrarian parables of Jesus. This was followed by a discussion of the question of the identity of the brothers of the Lord. And finally, we looked at the narrative of the storm at sea. In the current session, We'll look at the feeding of the 5,000 in its Lucan form and the first prediction of the Passion. Then the Transfiguration narrative will be discussed and we will conclude the session with an examination of the second prediction of the Passion. Let's begin by taking a quick look at the map of Galilee. As you can see, there are a couple of crossings of the Sea of Galilee traced on the map, to and from Capernaum. These trips went to an area known as Gergesa, where the, ex where the exorcism of the demoniac took place. There are actually three names for the area, Gerasa, Gergesa, and Gadara. Around Capernaum, to the east, is the city of Bethsaida. This is the site of the multiplication of loaves in the Lucan narrative. South and west of the Sea of Galilee is the location of Mount Tabor, where the Transfiguration took place. While the disciples are out on mission, Luke mentions that Herod the Tetrarch heard of Jesus' ministry and was perplexed. Now, this Herod is Herod Antipas, whom we spoke of in the discussion of chapter 3 of Luke. Upon the death of his father, Herod the Great, he received the regions of Galilee and Perea. He's perplexed because he heard some of his subjects saying that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. Others were saying that Elijah had appeared. And still others were saying that one of the prophets of old had arisen. Basically, these were the ways that people of the area and the day were interpreting the ministry of Jesus. The last two were expectations of Israel for the final days. According to Malachi 4.2, before the Messiah and the final days would come, Elijah would return. According to Deuteronomy 18:15 to 18, in the final days a prophet like Moses would return to set the, to set Israel straight in regard to the law. Some therefore thought that Jesus was one of these because of the similarity in the message of Jesus and John. Others thought that Jesus was John reincarnated. These popular understandings of Jesus' ministry will be important later in this session when we discuss the first Passion prediction. Herod responds to these estimations, reiterating the fact that he had John beheaded. So who is this about whom they are talking? Luke tells us that Herod sought to see him. That desire will be fulfilled in the Passion narrative. Luke links this story to the preceding by narrating the return of the apostles from their mission to recount for him what they had done. After that, Jesus and the disciples withdraw to the city called Bethsaida, presumably to rest and relax after the mission. Matthew and Mark set the location of the miracle in a lonely place. Only Luke describes the location as a city called Bethsaida. The attempt to get rest and solitude met with little success. The crowds who had been following Jesus caught wind of it and they followed him. This is yet another sign of the popularity of Jesus' mission. Jesus, for his part, welcomes the crowds who seek him out and he continues teaching the crowd about the kingdom of God and curing those who need healing. Even though he is seeking privacy to spend time instructing the disciples, 
he's willing to do for those people what he's been doing all along, instruct and heal. Luke drops the mark in reference to the fact that the crowds were like sheep without a shepherd. This is a picture of the outer courtyard of the Benedictine Church at Tabga. From the outer courtyard, one passes to the inner courtyard, which has a walkway around the four sides and a tree and shrubs growing in the middle. From this inner court, one passes into the church proper. It's an open church with no pews. Chairs can be set up for liturgy, but it usually is open like this. If circumstances allow, pilgrims may be allowed to walk into the sanctuary area. If you look carefully at the altar, there is a slightly elevated area made of rock. This commemorates the rock from which Jesus gave the multiplied bread to the disciples to give to the people. Behind the altar is one of the most famous mosaics of the Holy Land. It depicts the five loaves and two fish, chief objects in this narrative. Finally, one can go through small chapels behind the main church and come out on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Along this shore there are several altars where pilgrim groups can celebrate Mass in the quiet of Tabga and the Sea of Galilee. As Jesus' day begins to wear on, and evening time for dinner approaches. This begins to concern the twelve who initiate the conversation. They suggest that Jesus dismiss the crowd to go to buy provisions at the local in the stores of the local area and perhaps even get lodging for the night. The reason being that they are in a lonely place. Now some feel that we may have an editing problem here since Luke has in the narrative set it in the city of Bethsaida, which is now described as a lonely place. Jesus' reaction to that suggestion is a quick dismissal and a command. You give them something to eat. The twelve do not see that as a viable alternative, and so they move to plan B, the provisions that they have, namely five loaves and two fish, but these will not feed the crowd. So it would be necessary that they go and buy and purchase provisions. The editor adds an observation that gives the reader a better understanding of the enormity of the problem and ultimately the wonder of Jesus action. There were about 5,000 men. Now this is a crowd. Matthew makes the same observation but adds not counting women and children. So Matthew's crowd size grows even more. Jesus takes command of the situation and orders the twelve to make the crowds sit down as Luke puts it, in companies of about 50 each. Some have mused in the number 50 in the groupings. It could, possibly be, it could possibly be a number of soldiers in an army company. Hence, Jesus may be organizing an eschatological army to fight the evils in the world. Others see 50 as the number of people gathered in a home for the celebration of the liturgy. Thus, these groups foreshadow the worshiping communities of Jesus' day. Others, looking at the Greek word for company, klesia, this is really a couch upon which one reclines for eating a meal, not something that's used in the context of battle. Army explanations do not seem to fit. Luke also drops the mark in detail that they sit down on green grass, which is an allusion to Psalm 23. That, coupled with the reference to sheep without a shepherd, which Luke also drops, seems to eliminate the shepherd imagery that was so prominent in the Gospel of Mark. The twelve make the crowd sit down in response to Jesus' command. When the crowd is seated in an orderly fashion, Jesus takes the provisions that the twelve have brought him, <coughs> looks up to heaven, 
blesses them, breaks them, and gives them to the disciples to set before the crowd. The meager amount of food which the disciples place before Jesus, through him, has become enough to feed this vast crowd, with even some left over. The narrative concludes with the fact that all, 5,000 men, ate and had their fill. In other words, they were satisfied. And then there were leftovers, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Thus, an insufficiency through Christ has become a superabundance. Now, many have tried to discount the miraculous nature of this miracle, most significantly by saying that Jesus really got the people to share what they already had. Another explanation is that Jesus really broke the loaves into little bits and handed them out. Come on now, five loaves for 5,000, breaking them and handing them out? I don't think so. The scripture scholar Vanderloos draws a conclusion that is quite sensible. He says it is without a doubt a fascinating business to investigate how human ingenuity reaches new heights in its effort to eliminate the supernatural from this story of the feeding. Two significant texts follow upon this miracle narrative, the confession of Peter and the first prediction of the Passion. Matthew and Mark locate this narrative in the northern region of Caesarea Philippi, at the source of the Jordan River, around the area known as Banyas, or ancient Panium. Luke, in typical style, chooses to place the setting as one in which Jesus was at prayer. Without much elaboration, Luke transitions from the site of the loaves to the site of Peter's confession. As we mentioned before, before many of the significant moments of the Gospel, Luke portrays Jesus at prayer. So here, he's praying alone, yet the disciples are in the vicinity. When the prayer has finished, Jesus asks his disciples a curious question. Who do people say that I am? Literally, who do the crowds Hoi Okloi say that I am. After all this time, Jesus questioned who all those people who have been following, even when he wants to be quiet and have solitude, think he is. It's an identity question, but it's also a Christological question. The response is threefold, very similar to the response given when Herod asked the same question. John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. Again, taking into consideration most of the major expectations of the day. Then Jesus makes the question more pointed. Who do you say that I am? Peter, speaking for all the disciples, answers simply, the Christ of God, the Mashach Adonai, what the angel Gabriel said to Mary at the Annunciation narrative is now coming to pass. But what Peter means by Christ or Messiah of God, and what Jesus means, are quite different things. Peter sees the term in light of Jewish expectations, that is, one who would come from the Davidic line and reestablish the kingdom of David in place of the Romans. Peter sees Messiah or Christ in a political way. Since Peter does not see Jesus' messiahship in the same way as Jesus, his answer is met with a charge to tell no one. Since they don't fully understand what this means, anyone to whom they speak will not understand fully either. Therefore, it's best not to speak to anyone. Jesus then continues giving his understanding of what it means for him to be the Christ or the Messiah. Using his favorite term for himself, Jesus announces <clears throat> the Son of Man, that is, I, must suffer many things. The essence of Jesus' Messiahship is suffering, not conquest. He then defines exactly what that suffering entails. He
he will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, be killed, and be raised on the third day. In other words, the messiahship of Jesus involves very significantly his passion, death, and resurrection, as they will be narrated at the end of the Gospel. In other words, as Messiah, Jesus will be more like the servant of Isaiah who suffers on behalf of the people, much more than the political Messiah who will raise an army and eject the Romans. If Jesus' Messiahship means suffering, what does it mean to be his follower? Turning to all those gathered, not just the immediate inner, inner circle or the twelve, Jesus defines his discipleship. If anyone would come after me, the technical term come after me is a shorthand way of saying wishes to be my disciple. Jesus continues, let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me. As Jesus goes to the cross, so must his disciples embrace the cross in their lives. That embrace of the cross is embodied in putting oneself last, putting others first. That's the essence of denying oneself. For Luke, that's not a once-in-a-lifetime action. Luke says that action must take place daily, each day is to be an experience of the cross. To this basic principle, Luke now appends a series of statements as reasons for Jesus' understanding of discipleship. To understand these sayings properly, it's necessary to imagine a contrast between life in Christ and life according to the standards of the world. The first set of sayings contrasts these. Whoever would save his life, that is, live according to the standards of this world, will lose it, since that would involve a rejection of Jesus' way. We must constantly turn away from the values of this world and embrace the values of the kingdom and Jesus. Hence the corollary. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Leave behind the mores and ways of the world for the sake of Jesus, and it will be easy to embrace the values that he espouses. The third saying seems to capture the essence of it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? We can have everything in the eyes of the world. But the one thing that counts our self, our happiness, our sense of living in Christ, if that's not there, what good is it? St. Augustine says it well, Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Jesus then says the same thing in another way. Whoever is ashamed of him and his words which basically means refusal to accept Jesus and confess him publicly, accepting his authority. If one is not willing to do that, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. Then that one will have no part in the kingdom that will be inaugurated by the Messiah, Jesus. Then the section closes with a statement that there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. The meaning of that statement depends upon what Jesus meant by kingdom of God. Was it the full consummated glorious kingdom of the future? Was it a glimpse on the kingdom's glorious Christ? Or was it the kingdom of the resurrected and exalted Christ? The Church has always seen itself in between the first and the third. In the Resurrection, Jesus inaugurated the Kingdom, and so the Kingdom is already in our midst. But it's not yet totally present in our midst. We are awaiting the full consummation of the Kingdom. Thus, some who were standing there did experience the already of the Church, established by the resurrected Christ. 
and not to leave the second choice out, the glimpse of the kingdom's glorious Christ will be experienced by Peter, James, and John in the next narrative, the Transfiguration. Hence, Jesus' statement could mean many different things. The setting of the Transfiguration narrative has traditionally been thought to be Mount Tabor, the monastery upon which is pictured here. There are some, however, who think that the site might be a bit further north at Mount Hermon, since the texts say Jesus took the disciples up a high mountain. On the top of Mount Tabor is a Benedictine monastery, which commemorates the events of the Transfiguration. There are also the remains of buildings that date back to Crusader times in front of the main church. Inside that church, there is an upper church and a lower or crypt church. The church was designed by the Italian architect Barluzzi and was meant to highlight the light as the sun came through the windows and strikes a beautiful golden mosaic of a transfigured Jesus with the prophets Moses and Elijah which is located over the main altar of the upper church. In his transition, Luke notes that the events to be narrated take place about eight days after the teaching on suffering or the first passion prediction and the teaching on messiahship and discipleship. The action given is Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a mountain to pray. We notice again the theme of prayer entering here. When Jesus is at prayer in Luke, it's a signal that something important is about to happen. The account continues with Jesus' prayer, more significantly what occurred during Jesus' prayer. Luke tells us that as Jesus was in prayer, the outward appearance of his face was altered. Matthew and Mark describe it as metamorphothe. He was changed in form. He underwent a metamorphosis. Matthew adds the detail that his face shone as the sun. This is an attempt to get some clarity on what had happened. Further, Luke tells us his raiment became dazzling white. Mark adds a further detail to show exactly how white his clothing became. Glistening, very white, as no bleacher on earth could bleach them. You may, you may have heard the bleach commercial a number of years ago talking about how this particular bleach was whiter than white. That's what you have here. Each of the evangelist descriptions is an attempt to describe Jesus as physically transformed into a radiant figure whose brilliance extended even to his clothing. Two men appear talking with Jesus. They're identified as Moses and Elijah, the two major figures of the Old Testament. Many have argued as to what their significance may be. The traditional understanding has been that Moses represented the law, since he was given the law on Mount Sinai. Elijah would then represent the prophets. Thus, the two would represent the law and the prophets, which was the name given to the Hebrew scriptures. Thus, they represent the Old Covenant. But some would argue that they are better representatives of the prophets than Elijah, and would discount that view. A more recent view would have been that Moses looking backward to the Exodus, while Elijah looks forward to the promise of the final age. That would derive from the later understandings of, of Elijah, particularly drawn from the book of Malachi, where Elijah was expected to return prior to the Messiah in the final days. Whatever significance we give them, they clearly represent in some way the former covenant, while Jesus represents the new covenant. Thus, their appearance with Jesus would represent the continuity of the two. Moses and Elijah also appear in a glorified state. Only in Luke do we find the content of their discussion with Jesus. 
They're discussing his departure, his exodus, which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. We see a hint of the journey theme and the great journey that's soon to begin here. The word used for departure also has significance. It first of all reca recalls the great exodus of the Old Testament in which the Jewish nation was formed. In a parallel, it here refers to the passion, death, and ascension of Jesus, which will be accomplished in Jerusalem, through which the church, the new Israel, will be formed. As the gospel unfolds, the parallel between the Exodus and the Paschal mystery will also unfold. Thus far, the narrative has centered on what has been happening to and with Jesus and correspondingly Moses and Elijah. We hear very little about Peter, James, and John. Luke gives us a reason for that. They were heavy with sleep. This will not be the only time that they fall asleep while Jesus is at prayer. We will see that again in the garden. But soon they wake up. They see what has been described, Jesus' glory and the two men standing with them, with him. As the experience is coming to a close, Peter steps in with a suggestion. Master, he says, it is good, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The mention of booths or tents gives the impression that Peter wants to prolong this special moment. But also the mention of booths recalls the great Feast of Tabernacles, which looked back at God's provision in the wilderness and was regarded as anticipating God's ultimate deliverance. This also explains the presence of Moses in Elijah. Peter feels that this is much more the Messiah that he pictures Jesus to be than the Messiah that Jesus described in the first Passion prediction. So Peter wants to keep this experience. Then Luke mentions an unusual fact. He, Peter, did not know what to say. This side, not of Luke, go, this is a side of Luke going back to the first Passion prediction. Peter did not understand, and as a result did not agree with Jesus' notion of Messiahship. That misunderstanding continues here, where Peter sees this as the true messiahship. However, whatever we say about Peter's statement, it is soon interrupted by another voice from a cloud, similar to the baptismal narrative. Luke tells us that as Peter was speaking, a cloud overshadows them. This is the same word that is used in the Holy, of the Holy Spirit and Mary at the moment of Jesus' conception at the Annunciation. They, Peter and John and James, entered the cloud with fear. The cloud also recalls the wandering in the desert where the Israelites were led by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. That cloud, as this one, was a sign of the presence of God with his people leading them, guiding them, and protecting them. Thus the answer is not building tents or booths to prolong this experience. The answer is to trust in God's care, love, concern, and protection as they go forth into the events in Jerusalem. A voice comes from the cloud. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. The allusion to the servant of Isaiah from the baptism is re reiterated here. Jesus is Davidic Messiah or Son, but also is servant of Isaiah, the Chosen One, who suffers on behalf of his people. Then the command, listen to him. This suffering is just what Jesus had announced in the first Passion prediction. It's not basking in, the experience, in this experience that's significant, this experience of the glorified Lord. It's using this experience of the glorified Lord to realize that God will be with them as they enter into the experience of the Passion. 
Once the voice has spoken, the experience comes to an end. Moses and Elijah are no longer there. Only Jesus is left, now in his normal appearance. Both the words of the voice and the conclusion of the experience show Peter, James, and John, and us, that it's Jesus who was significant. The Old Testament, the Law, and the Prophets have disappeared, giving way to the message of Jesus. Luke ends the narration with a note that the disciples kept this experience to themselves and told no one. Another exorcism follows the transfiguration narrative. Then Jesus makes a second prediction of the passion and the suffering that will take place in Jerusalem, which the disciples now should listen to. All the crowd is amazed at what Jesus was doing, his preaching, his healing, and his exorcisms. But Jesus will not remain in the positive reaction, ma making a positive reaction on the crowd. He looks to the future, speaking to his disciples. The disciples are not to be misled by this positive reaction, but times are coming when the reaction of the crowds will not be so positive. The introduction to the second prediction is somewhat solemn. Rather than saying, listen to what I have to say, Jesus says, you put these words in your ears or let these words sink into your ears. In other words, listen and keep these words with you. Then the prediction. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. The tide will soon change, and the disciples need to be ready for that. Luke then editorializes, they telling us they, the disciples, did not understand this saying. And it was concealed from them that they should not perceive it. The misunderstanding of the disciples is really an inability to comprehend how such a betrayal could occur. How could the one that God sent to save be betrayed? But Luke does not lay the incomprehension totally at the feet of the apostles. It was concealed from them, he says. God was keeping comprehension from them, with the result that they did not have the ability to piece together the total plan of God. Perhaps as they accompany Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem, they will gain greater comprehension. In any event, Luke tells us that they were afraid to ask him to explain this. Fitzmaier comments that this fear may also be the result of a realization that what was in store for Jesus might also be in store for them. We are approaching the end of the Galilean ministry as it is narrated in Luke. In our next session, we'll make the transition from the ministry in Galilee to the great Lucan journey narrative.